Praise Jesus Christ. You are highly blessed. The Lord is good. He is a refuge in the time of trouble. He takes care of those who trust in him. A whom 1 and verse 5. Welcome very much. I thank and bless the name of the Lord because of you. And uh, it is my faith that the Lord has absolute intention to do you good and take you from one glory to another glory. I'm Joel Hapame, and I'm blessed to have Lord inside me. Welcome to today's lesson. And today we are learning about how pastors make money in the kingdom of God. Pastors secret to money. Pastors secret to money. Because <clears throat> If you go around in our society, and especially in our Christian society, the people who are struggling, and they are struggling seriously, they are going through sufferings that are very extreme to some extent that you cannot even understand why they are suffering are servants of God. And still, if you look at the people in our society who are mostly considered as a supernatural, as abnormal, as a superordinary, they are the servants of God. We have the tendency to think that they don't live amongst us or they live magically. But this servant of God, they eat just like you. They wear clothes like, just like you. They, they, they live in a house just like you. Their children go to school like you. And even themselves go to school just like some of you. And even others do business. And others are employed just as like you. Serving God is just a privilege. But apart from the anointing, everything else, he is a human being. Just like you. And they have challenges. Now, the problem now we have is, how do the servants of God make money? Because their ways of making money are limited. <coughs> God has controlled so much how a pastor should make money. Such that if those ways that God has put in place for the servant of God to make money don't work, don't work, that servant of God will find himself in a very serious financial crisis. So they must work. But how can they work if we don't know them? So you must know. In the Bible, how has God said, 
a servant of God should make money. And that's why you find those who have been able to discover those ways or those who have matured to the payroll of God, those who have <clears throat> been able to actuate and actualize and operationalize the money-making pastoral dimension, they are living large. They are living like kings. And also, this is the reason why you are finding in our churches today, they are all kind of modern and civilized witchcraft. Still servant of God trying to make money. Because it is not easy to make money in the kingdom of God. And it is also very easy to make money in the kingdom of God. Very difficult if you don't know how. Very easy if you know how. Pray Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I, I always tell people that uh, the last battle and a serious battle, a servant of God fight before he enters into his glory is a battle of money. Because this is a greatest weapon that the devil uses to limit and control the effectiveness of an anointing in a person. If the devil manages to cage your finances so you walk moneyless, the devil knows your effectiveness is absolutely limited. And that's why you find many, 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 many servants of God have quit, have given up because of severe sufferings they go through. They beg, they beg, they beg until there is no one else left to beg. They borrow, they borrow, they borrow, they borrow until there is no one else available to borrow from. So, and the options fail completely. They eventually surrender and quit. And they go to, to the pagan system. Others are more bored. You know, there are those who have the fear of God. They would, they would rather quit. But there are those who are more worried, bored. They venture into, into modern witchcraft. And they start merchandising and entrepreneuring the workings of God. They start selling prophecies. They start charging. Uh, 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 uh. They start charging uh, consultations. They start selling items in the church. Because, they, because they, they, they just want to make money. Because money makes everything else here on earth work. That's why the, the, the author of Ecclesiastes said, money answers all things. So they venture into wild practices. They are selling water. They are selling oil. They are selling brooms. They are selling paint. They are selling stickers. They are selling handkerchiefs. And everything else, the others, they are selling losalis. Crosses, they are selling crosses, saying it is divine once you wear it. Blah, 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 blah. Those are our charms, modern charms. In the first Timothy, chapter number 5, and verse 8, there are some scriptures I would like us to read, and I believe they are going to help us. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if we read this verse together, child of God, it, it, it teaches us a lot that the area of financial 
capacitation of a believer is very, very, very important because it shows or it, it indicates what kind of faith you profess. Because Paul tells Timothy, one who cannot be able to provide for his relatives, and especially the immediate family, if you're a husband like me, immediate family is my wife and my children. If I cannot provide for my wife and my children, the Bible is telling me I have denied faith. It says my faith is no longer factual. My faith is no longer practical. It is no longer working. In other words, my faith does not exist. That's how dangerous it is. And then he says number two, and it's worse than an unbeliever. And those are two dangerous biblical statements. Because it is so weighty that if you cannot provide for your children, you cannot provide for your wife, and you are a believer, and more than that, you are not just a believer, you are a servant of God. The Bible is telling you that two things are happening in your life that you have denied faith. You have breached faith. You have breached faith. In other words, you have backslidden. And number two, you are worse than a non-believer. This judgment. And when you, when you read this statement to a devoted, committed, and convicted nurturing servant of God, somebody who is being nurtured, and you tell them because they're in that condition, they don't have faith. And tell them that because in that condition, they are worse than non-believers. I'm telling you, you would hurt that person at their most. Because that person, his or her life has crossed up to follow. You know, there is a difference between following Christ and serving Christ. Following Christ, you don't have to go through some certain things that other people go through. But the serving Christ, oh, here I'm a shaker, yada, yada. serving Christ, Christ has stated it categorically. <clears throat> if you follow Christ, you must carry your own cross. And the cross is a picture of suffering for salvation. Suffering for glory. For the Bible says that don't you know that the Christ had fast to suffer, then enter into his glory. Romans 8 and verse 17. That if you suffer for Christ, you will also share in his glory. And that's why you find people don't understand. Why a pastor would pray for somebody and a miracle would happen instantly. But it's somebody who has a calling inside, somebody who has a ministry inside, you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray for him and nothing is working. Nothing is working. To a point, you get the tired of that person. Because you think they are cast. But they are in the process of being nurtured. They are being developed by God. Because God is going to use them in a very mighty way. So God is expanding their, in, their internal, their internal capacity. Because they are not just a believer. They are a mantle carriers. They are a mandate implementers. There's a person inside who is carrying like 10,000 people. Like 100,000 people inside himself. So God is expanding that capacity. There's a person inside himself. God is going to trust him with a budget of more than 50 billion. 
inside himself, God is going to trust him with a workforce of more than 1,000 people. Under him, there will be more than 1,000 pastors. A workforce. People will be depending on him. This is a person who is going to have some certain institutions inside himself. He will have a church. He will have a school. He will have some other institutions <coughs> that work together for the advancement of the kingdom of God, like hospitals. So you can pray for other people and the miracles happen like tua, 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 tua. And you can pray for this one and nothing works. Actually, you pray for them and the things become difficult. You need to, you need to understand what's the difference between somebody who has an anointing and somebody who is just a beneficiary of the anointing. How things work for the two is not the same way. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in my ministry. Pray Jesus Christ. That's why you find you can meet a pastor who is praying for people and people are making it. People are progressing. People are advancing. But he himself is stuck there. Actually, you pray for people. They make it and they don't do their offerings to you. They go to offer the offerings to those who have already made it. But you're the one who prayed for you are the one who prayed for that miracle to happen. But the benefit of that miracle, they take it elsewhere. It is a, it is a, it is a, it is a difficult thing. For someone, chapter number three and verse 13, the Bible says, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. A deacon, but story of a deacon must be the husband of but one wife and he must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in the faith in Christ Jesus. I want to vote for you You who is a minister of gospel and the kingdom of God. That it is possible <clears throat> to walk in the financial excellence. It is possible. Serving God is not a judgment to suffering. It's not a judgment to struggles. Actually, Actually, I can dare say it is a judgment to glory. It's only that there is that stage at which you must be nurtured to fit in the kingdom programs and in the kingdom economy so that you can operate with the kingdom systems. Pray Jesus Christ. So that you can operate the kingdom systems. There is that a time in which you have to be developed so that you can fit in the kingdom payroll. And that's why the man of God is telling Timothy that those who have served well gain an excellent standing. And that is where we are entering because he says you must first of all have served well. To gain an excellent standing and a great assurance of faith in Christ Jesus, you must as fast have served well. So you 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 will find yourself serving, serving because you are being tested. If you are serving well, serving is not just serving. You know there are people who are at that stage, but they have manipulated the stage. They have manipulated the stage. And you find ears are just getting wasted without a headway, without a direction, without an assurance, without getting an excellent standing. And let me tell you, that time of serving well 
without benefit. Get me? Without gain is expiring. And we are entering into a space in which it will be testified that we are on an excellent standing. An excellent standing. Servant of God, ministers of the gospel. Excellent standing is our portion. And assurance in the faith. There are people that just believe and things happen. And you, you believe, you believe until you ask. What then does it mean to believe? Because you don't know what it is to believe because you have believed, you have believed, you have believed, and your faith is not working. But when you have served well, your faith enters into another level. That it becomes now an assurance. It kind, it kind, it is an insurance. It is a guarantee that your faith, when you 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 apply faith, it confirms to you that the Hebrew story of us one. It confirms to you. It guarantees to you. And it assures you that what you have believed is going to function. So we are entering into another. And chattered waters where things work. Praise Jesus. I don't know whether you have ever worked before you came to, to serving God. And uh, in a setup in which you work but you are not paid, that the same ways servant of God feel and go through. That they are working for God. But God has set it that way. No salary. No payment. No reward system. Nobody comes along the way to partner with this person. Because they are being tested if they are serving out of will or out of compulsion. Are they being compelled to serve? Are they being forced to serve? Like Jonah? Or is it emanating from inside them? If God attests that the, these people have accepted that the, this is the way of their lives, and when God accepts financial grace, to rest on them, they are not going to depart from the perfect ways of the Lord. God allows them to flow with the financial graces. Praise Jesus Christ. Because pastors, above anyone else, they should work with serious money. Because they are seen as divine intervention agents. Yes. They are seen as divine intervention agents. No <clears throat> person who believes, no person who can believe that can come to a man of God with a problem. And leave the presence of that servant of God when that servant of God has not done something to change that person's life apart from just prayers. Can you go to James? And he spoke about it, even John. We spoke about it yesterday when we were talking about giving. That you 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 are you you have material possessions. And you see a brother of yours who is in need, and you don't do anything uh, concerning his need, how can the love of God be inside you? Pastors are seen, ministers of gospel, are seen as agents of divine intervention. Yes, they will tell you, I know God has intervened, but 
God is using you to intervene. My children have not eaten two days. And that woman has come to you, the servant of God. Will you tell that woman, let, let's hold her together and believe God? Yes, you will do that. And then after that, after believing God, she will be looking at your face for you to do something at least, at least to make her faith firm. And you just release her, you just release him. You have actually thrown that person into despair. Yes. Mark chapter number 8, verse 20. What does the Bible have to say? <clears throat> and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls or pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, Do you still not understand? Praise Jesus Christ. This story has two dimensions. If you can read it from verse 1, it has two dimensions. Jesus Christ providing for the multitude. He performed a miracle. He multiplied the bread and the fish. They ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate until they were satisfied. But providing for the disciples, providing for the designate apostles, he taught them to pick up while caught in. So now you are able to see that the dimension of the approach that the God uses to provide for the two groups is different. The first group, that is a multitude, miracles. They, they just need miracles. But the people who are mantle bearers, he is telling them, Muokote. Pray Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he is telling them to pick up the broken pieces that nothing should get lost. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? In the previous miracle of the 5,000, they picked up 12 basketfuls for each Disciple, but remember, they were pieces, meaning they were leftovers, and that is why I feel pain when anybody condemns a servant of God. Because for a servant of God to make money, it takes the hand of God, but for a believer to make it, it just need a miracle. But a man of God, he does not need a miracle. A man of God, it is about collecting. Collecting. That is why you are told to make offerings because they make money through collecting, picking the leftovers. That's why you bring to the servant of God offerings. What are offerings? In most cases, are you are leftovers. You have had 50,000. You cannot pick 50,000 and give it to the man of God. No sooner than the later, you will call him a conman. You will call him a fraudster. You get that? You find, you, you, you look for something. You look for something. And you set aside like 1,000 or a punch. And you give it to the man of God. That's how they make money. They correct. They pick the, 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 the broken pieces. That's how they make money. But the people, they eat the quality. They eat the multiplied miracle, the multiplied bread. But the, the, but the apostles, for them to eat, Jesus told them, do you see now they have gone? Yes. So there are so many scattered 
pieces of bread here and fish. So many scattered pieces, pieces, pieces. Can you go now and correct? That is your portion. And they found each of them picked a basket full. A big basket and it was filled. That's why you find servant of God walking with huge manes because they pick Habana Haba Ujaza Kibaba. So, so don't call them a servant of God. He could be picking the left of us. But when he brings them together, they amount to large quantities. But it takes the hand of the Lord. It takes patience. Imagine they were eating and the disciples are just there watching. And Jesus had gone with them on the mountain side so that they could rest because they were coming from the ministration and finding something to eat. And here they are being told to some people to eat fast. So this is a double hunger. And also they are tired. So the servant of God go through a very rigorous process of patience. When they have to watch as others eat, as others get blessed, they have to wait for their time to come. Because them, their way is not like theirs. Theirs is a miracle. But for the apostles, how they make it is to pick the left of us, is to correct. But something you need to understand is this. If then they have to correct, then they have to correct very many pieces. That is why you find when a servant of God grows to that level, you can find God commanding like 1,000 people to make offering to that servant of God. Like 1,000 people. And they are all making an offering of 100 shillings a day. Because he is preaching a day, in each and every day, online. He's made preach. And God has commanded 1,000 people to make offerings to him of 100 shillings, minimum offering. That is 100,000 Kenya shillings. Because these are, he is speaking, he is correcting. He is correcting left all of us. But so many of them, so many of them, so they are very broken episodes. They are very literal. They are, they are very little, but many. So when he brings them together, they build a very huge mountain of money. That, that's when you start, we start now calling them fraudsters. Do not be envious of the servants of God. If you are told to go through what they go through, you will curse God. That's why I'm telling people online, be very careful on what you're speaking there. Even there are some servants of God, they're speaking things that you will just have mercy on them because they are working for Satan without knowing. They don't understand that Jesus Christ in himself there, he has like seven dimensions of gospel and they are stuck with one single dimension only. And Christ has like seven dimensions. Can read Revelation 5 verse 12. Has like a Seven dimensions of gospel. And you find somebody is just stuck with one dimension of gospel. And especially, there are these people who are stuck with the dimension of the, of the word of knowledge. They are calling it the revelation of Christ. It's the other one who, who crucified Jesus Christ. And they made him resurrect. So they know him much better than others. If you're just in one dimension of gospel, allow others who are in other dimensions also flourish. There are those, why, oh, why do we have seven offices of Christ? Seven. Not five, seven. Why is Jesus Christ holding seven stars in his hand? Revelation 1. He has seven dimensions of gospel. Even in Isaiah 11, he speaks of seven dimensions of the Holy Spirit. So just perfect in the dimension in which 
you have been called in. Don't venture into others' dimensions. And because you have, God has not given you permission to talk about those other dimensions, and because you don't have the, the correct information about those dimensions, you resort to tarnishing those who are in those dimensions. No. Who is tarnishing your dimension? Stick to your reign. Stick to your reign. Those who have been called by God in the area of soul harvest, evangelists, perfect. Those who have been called in the area of pastoring, transformation of lives, perfect. Those who have been called in the area of healing, perfect. Heal and heal kabisa. Those who have been called in the area of deliverance, cast out demons completely without seeking anyone's approval. Those who have been called in the area of redemption. These are the people who talk about altars, foundations, background, the curses, covenant, and all those. Do it. Those who have been called in the area of prosperity. They speak about money. They speak about dimensions of blessedness. They speak about prosperity, wealth, riches. Speak and speak and speak and speak without fear. If you have been called in the area of priesthood, do it and perfect. If you are called in the area of kingship, do it and perfect. When we reach to heaven, each and every one of us will be judged according to the work and according to the offices that the God is. If God is sent you into the office of a king and you went to work in the office of a pastor, it will be very harsh for you. Go to your office of king. Make practice authority. Exercise authority. Govern. Lead. Instruct. If you're an apostle, don't apologize. If you're a prophet, don't apologize, but you don't do divination. Because you're the Yoshida Mauna you are very quickly prudging into divination. If you are a pastor, be content. And you don't compete with anybody. Compete with your office. Luke 14 and verse 28. Suppose one of you want to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he raised the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. And I, I know very much, I know very well, that many servants of God have fallen under this trap. You start a ministry, but you do not assess whether you have requisite financial capacity. You just thought God is going to send leavens. But you didn't know whether you have matured to the level of God sending leavens on your way. That's why you find many pastors are quoting scriptures. They are praying with the scriptures ear in, ear out, and they are not working. Eventually they get offended by God. When you're starting a ministry, Make sure you have matured in a certain area you want to go and function in. You want to go and heal people? Make sure you have matured in that. You have developed the requisite capacity. You want to go and cast out demons? Make sure you have nurtured yourself and matured enough in that area lest you go and be embarrassed by demons like the sons of Scepha. If you are going to Start a ministry. Make sure inside you, you it is not a must you be having the the, 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 the the physical money, but make sure you have the spiritual money that when you start the ministry, you know very well, ravens will locate you. Ravens will locate you and you will not struggle. That's why you say, sit down and estimate the cost. To see if he has enough money to complete it. This money is not physical money. It's not material money. This is spiritual money. But there are people who start very well. And they start very strongly. 
but inside their spirit, there was no enough reservoir for spiritual money. So when they were growing in the ministry, they were not givers. They were not tithers. They were not, they, they were not sacrificial. So in the spiritual realm, there is no enough deposit to, 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 to impact or to impart their physical administration with the money. So they exhaust their treasure in heaven within just first year of operation. And from there, they enter into financial scarcity. And that is when, when that happens, they enter into modern, civilized witchcraft. They start selling items because there is nothing left in their spiritual treasure. The deposit has been exhausted. Praise Jesus Christ. So key number one, we have, we have talked about like 40 minutes, laying the foundation. Key number one is direct the affairs of gospel of God well. If, pastor, you are going to make money in serving God, make sure. Let us read the scripture, 1 Timothy, because we must stand to the scripture. 1 Timothy, chapter number 5 and verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those, those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox or is treading out the grain. And the worker deserves his wages. Do not, okay. So key number one, for a servant of God to make money in the gospel, he must make sure he direct the affairs of the church well. To get the double honor, there is that general honor, oh man of God, and then there is the other honor, financial honor. Muto na kwachia kakito na kwachia kabahasha pare. The other honor is material honor. So key number one, as a servant of God, as a minister of gospel, make sure that you direct the affairs of the gospel well. I don't know how you will understand that phrase, but the way God will help you to understand it, make sure you are a good steward, you are a good manager. There are many servants of God who don't know how to, to, they don't have managerial skills. You know? I don't know whether they are sanguines. They don't have proper managerial skills, but they direct the affairs of the gospel well. Why? To get double honor. There is that natural honor, they are the honor for the anointing. And then there is material honor, material honor. That is financial honor. Number two, he has said, uh, especially those who work is preaching and teaching. You get me? Uh, for the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. The next thing is activate, activate the law of provision. We shall come to see it later, but activate the law of provision. We will come back to that later. Instruct, instruct in the word. Galatians 6 and verse 6. Galatians 6 and verse 6. There is something there written there. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Get me? This is an area that many servants of God are being denied. Praise Jesus Christ. But the term used here is instruct in the word. Make sure for a man of God, there is somebody in your life you are instructing in the word. Why? Because if you instruct people in the word, teaching, instruction means teaching. Teach the word. You are instructing in the word. You are giving directives through the word. You are guiding. You are counseling by the word. You are saying, the one who is receiving those instructions has been commanded 
This is a spiritual principle to share all good things. All good things. And that is why you find if there is a certain man of God who helped you, who helped you in your times of calamities, and you made it, and after that, you went and you forgot them. You went and forgot that servant of God. Life has a tendency of making you have a similar need and a more painful need than the one in which he helped you. So that God can teach you why he was helping you. God was helping you through that servant of God so that when you make it, now it comes back to you as a responsibility to chip in in the area of need of the servant of God. And you shall see through the scriptures. And when many people have this tendency and this behavior, you know a certain servant of God has a certain grace. You go there and you pretend and you make very many profound promises. If you stand enemy and things are going to work, man of God, I am going to do A, B, C, D. And the man of God believes and he spent himself he tarries himself in the presence of God, convincing God to bless you. And once you break through, you forget them. Until when it is used up, until when you have wasted away, until when the grace is gone, that is when you remember, who was that who made me achieve what I achieved that time? That's when you start looking for them. When you have nothing. Actually, when you, 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 when you are in a worse condition than that time. I'm telling you, I cannot look at you. Face to face. Akuna. Because you have, you have come to use me again. You have not learned a lesson. This is where the servant of God make money from. If I am instructing you in the word then you are under obligation to share all good things with me because I am your instructor. So servant of God for you to make money, develop instructive spiritual capacity. Mostly don't be just motivators. Don't just be philosophers of the gospel. Don't just be historians of the gospel. The history of the church, you're just there. Develop instructive capabilities. Because the Bible has said, in order for somebody to share all good things, you must have instructed. The term there is instructor. Be an instructor in the word. Number three, be a peace ambassador. Servant of God, we must fall into this trap where we scatter and we set the fire back to the sender. Be a peacemaker. Luke 10 verse 4 to 7. Uh, do not take a pass or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. So Jesus told them what is going to help you access a person of provision. It is only if you will be able to transact peace. If you enter in that house, say, peace be in this house. If a man of peace is in that house, that peace will rest on him. And as a result of that, that person will find himself providing you with everything you require. And don't move about. Don't move about. 
nowadays we are moving about we are very much moving about we are very much moving about but he says don't move about so peace peace is margin it is a financial ingredient so servant of god do you carry peace that's why you don't connect with the people of provisions why they connect with the peace there are many servants of god who are growing who are still stuck in the in the in the scattering and 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 and, and, and dispersing prayers i scatter i disperse by the way if you are this kind of a pastor you cannot attract any financial help of any kind you are a warfare person not even on fighting demons but you you, you are not a peacemaker you know the problem with this is this it is not physical this is internal this internal personality it has to deal with the inner you and the bible is categorically stating if you carry peace and you are a servant of god you are advancing gospel and you carry peace inside you that peace connects you with a person of provision because that person is seeking peace there are so many people out there who are in search of peace they are looking for a church where they can just <clears throat> find peace peace in their marriages peace in their health peace mental and psychological peace if you are a man of peace they find a refuge in you and you know it's not something that you can fake you must believe there are people even when you sit with them you feel your spirit forming mm. you feel your spirit stirring up and you fail to understand why because when you look at this person physically they look as if they are a safe heaven for you but inside the holy spirit can detect they are a wolf they are a ferocious beast they are just pretending no sooner than the later they will devour you they will tear you in pieces and you be left for all so servant of god if you want to connect to the people of provisions you want to connect with the supply develop original true peace of christ inside you so that you can transact through peace one of the fruit of the holy spirit is peace now you see the reason why it is one of the fruit of the holy spirit because that peace imagine there's a very rich person moving around he is just looking for a place where he can find peace imagine hosting zacchaeus he was he was tormented with the, with the kind of the work he was doing of taxing for the romans he was taxing his people for the romans so he was tormented he was hated nobody liked him he was looking for peace and jesus came with that peace you can only imagine what zacchaeus did he said half of my wealth i give to the poor so he invested in the ministry of jesus as the ministry of charity he invested half of his wealth there are people many of them who are moving around here they don't have peace like a sinner my two man has money but she is tortured because of childlessness and elisha is moving about here a holy man of god so she finds 
peace. She finds security in this servant of God. Why? He is not a threat to her. He is not posing sexual predator spirit. He is holy. And that's why even she can even campaign for him to, to her husband. And her husband accepts. Invest in peace, ambassadorial work. Pray Jesus Christ. Something else is contentment, man of God. For you to qualify, for you to... These are secrets of the servant of God to make money. That's why I told you, you are different from other people. You must pass the test of contentment. Philippians 4, verse 14. But we can read from verse 11. I am, I have run... I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what is to be in need and I know what is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any in, in, in every situation. Whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. You can read verse 18. I have received full payment. And even more, I am some prey, I am ample surprised now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, their fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. At what point did Paul start receiving from Macedonian? It is when he ran the secret of being content. So meaning originally Paul was not a, co a content person. Remember, he had been brought up with a good life. Remember, he was a lawyer. He was brought up under Gamaliel. He was from Tarsus to Detake. But when he passed, he learned the secret of being content. People from Macedonia were stunned by the Spirit of God and they set Epaphroditus with a full payment and they ample supplied him and even he had the surplus. He, the contentment. And that's why you see the, the, the author of the book of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter number uh, 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 13, and verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content in what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. For, for the servant of God to start making money, I'm telling you, and this one I have gone through it and I know it is true. If you have not passed the test of contentment, contentment, that's what Paul told Timothy, contentment and godliness is great gain. If you have not passed the test of contentment, you find people come your way. They have the capacity to provide you with everything. But at the same time they come, at the same time they leave. And you normally say expectation is the mother of all frustrations. And because you have seen they have the ability, you developed expectations. And when it is not met, it purges you into a state of discouragement and frustrations that you have never seen there before. But Paul is saying, why did you people of Macedonia start sending Epaphroditus to come and bring me my salary, bring me my payment, to unprecedented my needs, and even leaving me with the surplus is simply because I learned the secret of contentment. Let me tell you something. It is in contentment you are able to do everything through him who gives you strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That verse only applies to them who are in the state of 
contentment. Greed disqualifies a pastor from financial breakthrough. Appetite for money, craving for money, will only distance a servant of God from money. But contentment, contentment means you can stay with and you can stay without. In season and out of season, you can still be a fruit. And you are not serving to make money, but you are serving to advance the will of God. And it, 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 is, it is mostly a very painful test. Yes, because it can take even years to make sure, to make sure you are genuine. You are not, you are not, uh, you are not faking it. You know, if you know that is the way, you will have the tendency to fake it. No, God sees the heart. God tests the mind. The moment you pass the test of contentment, Paul says, once I run the secret of being content in every situation, that is when I started getting special grace of doing everything through Christ who gives me strength. That is when I entered into that grace in which somebody can Epaphroditus can be commissioned. Epaphroditus is a spirit of supply, is a, is a, a spirit of provision. That is when this Epaphroditus spirit is activated in you, and that is when you start seeing pastor. Even you start seeing you are saving some money. That you can even start seeing your account recording some several millions. But if you have not yet come to pass the test of contentment, you only find something to put you in your stomach and nothing more than that. Something else, let us now go to 1 Corinthians 9, 4 to 12, is a, activate the law of provision. Activate the law of provision. There is the law that speaks about the servant of God. Can we read verse? Uh, uh, can we read verse nine? Uh, yeah. Let us start from verse seven. The God will give. The God will give us grace. Okay, how do I read? Let us read verse three. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the light to food and drink? Don't we have the light to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Kevas? Or is it I only? Or is it only I, anybody numbers, who must work for a living? So servants of God are not supposed to work for a living. For Jesus Christ. But you guys squeeze one a pig sana. Romans 4 verse 4. Now then, now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but the trust God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Let us continue. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Now we are back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and it does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a frog and it does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely for a human point of view? Doesn't the, doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses. That's why I said, activate the law of provision. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Have you activated this law? Because if you haven't, if you haven't activated this law, you will find that you tread the grain, but you are a muzzled. You tread the yeah yeah that is when treading out the grain. So you tread out the grain, you pray for people, but you are muzzled to eat, so you can't receive. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely He says this for us, doesn't He? Yes, this was written for us because when the proud man plows and the thresher dresses, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. You get me? The proud man 
sprouts that the pastor and the thresher, thresher that is you harvesting, making profit, making money. We should, both of us should do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we do not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than heed the gospel of God. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. I think we can just go to that far because of time. Number one is activate the role of provision. That is Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Make that throw become a reality. You can even, as a pastor, as a minister, you can even make an offering for that law and tell God, I want this law to become a reality in my life. And this is Paul teaching about the, this, this new covenant. This is a grace gospel and he is applying law. Number two, he is saying, so spiritual blessings. He is saying, if we have Verse 11, if you have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Man of God, servant of God, ministers of gospel, if you want to make money through serving God, bless people. Bless and don't curse. Bless and don't curse. First Peter, chapter number three. The man of God puts it this way. Yeah? Verse 9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with the blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Bless, bless and bless and bless and bless. So spiritual blessings. So spiritual blessings. Spread it everywhere. That's why even Jesus tells us to bless even our enemies. Because if you are a good in sowing spiritual seed, you qualify to Reaping a material harvest. And I know many servants of God who don't do this. They are very selfish. They are very self-centered. And you can see it in Romans chapter number 15 verse 27. 15 and verse 27. They were priests to do it. And indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So servants of God, you want to make money, Release spiritual blessings to people. Release. Don't bless yourself. Bless them. Why? Because when you do that, you, you receive, you qualify now to receive materially. You qualify to receive materially. But if you just want to receive materially and you have not released spiritually, there is no transaction. You get that? That's what it is called the ministry of giving and receiving. Pray Jesus Christ. Something else he has said. Those who preach gospel should receive their living from the gospel. The next thing is preach gospel. You will get living from the gospel. So, so then understand what gospel is. Preach gospel. Don't preach philosophy. Don't preach theology. Don't preach psychology. Don't preach polit po po politics. Don't preach the things that we are seeing nowadays being preached. Because the Bible says, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So, understand what gospel is. Then you preach it. You're asking me, what man of God, what does a gospel mean? You, uh, somebody will tell you it means good news. Then what is good news? What's a good news? You can just, it is defined by Christ in Luke chapter number four. That's what the gospel is. In Luke chapter number four, yeah? Luke chapter number four, in verse 18, 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Number one, preach good news to the poor. Number two, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Number three, and recovery of sight for the bride. And number four, to release the oppressed. And number five, to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor. Preach gospel. That's gospel. Know why the anointing of God is upon you. Enter the Bible. Study about the anointing. Study about the mantle. Study about the mandate. And then do it. He says, when you preach gospel, you are rife. You are reaving. We will come from that gospel. So if you if you wander, if you get out of the gospel, then you are on your own and you will suffer. Because you will be expecting God to do something, but he's not doing it because you are preaching. You will be like those people who came and told Jesus Christ that uh, we preached in your name, uh, we prophesied in your name, we casted out demons in your name, and we healed in your name. And Jesus told them, go, I do not know you. Now you will be in the category of those people. So preach gospel. Praise Jesus Christ. Then there's something else that uh, has been listed here. Another source of money for the servants of God is, don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? Then work from the temple because you get your food from the temple. I think that's a secret. Become a temple of God. If you are a minister of gospel, before even you do anything, make sure first of all you are the temple of God. Because he says, those who work in the temple should get their food from the temple. Do you work from the temple or do you work from the body? Many servants of God, many ministers are working from their bodies. But work from the temple because only when you work from the temple, you get food from that temple. And then there is something else. And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. The next thing is this. Serve. Let me just serve at the altar. Because there is no altar without meat. There is no altar without meat. Now, the problem here is this. Many servants of God are serving God, but not at the altar. But not at the altar. They don't have altars. Just believed. You just get God, good communication, uh, whatever. So you can uh, articulate the gospel, you can speak well. You get that? No. Serve at the altar because you share what is offered on the altar. These are a very major secret. It's only that we are ignorant in this generation. But the problem here is this, you, my generation, the problem is this, we don't have the Bible for this generation. We don't have a Bible for this generation. The Bible is one. And even when we shall come to the last generation, they do not have their own Bible. It is the same Bible they will find here. <coughs> so the principles remains constant. So understand that. Those are secrets that makes us pastor or a minister of gospel access money in the kingdom of God. The role of provision is activated. Do not muzzle an ox where it is treading out the grain. Number two, preach gospel. Don't preach stories. Preach gospel. Number three, he said what? Sow spiritual seed. We saw it in Romans 15 verse 27. Sow spiritual seed. Panda, kwawatu. Number four, we have been told what? Serve a work in the temple. Work in the temple. Don't work in the body. Many people are working from their bodies, but they turn your body into a temple. And number five, serve at the altar. Serve at the altar. Many people are serving from the rooftop. They are serving from their mind. They are not serving from their hearts. 
serve at the altar. If God gives you a better understanding, it is okay. Oh, our time is gone. Uh, and I'm going to church. Something else is activate grace. Grace. Power of grace. Power of grace. Mm. Know your grace. Acts 4, 32. Acts 4, 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With the great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them. So what happened to them when much grace was upon them? When the power was upon when the great power was upon them and much grace was upon them. Verse 34. There were no needed persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the seals, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph arrived from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So you see, imagine, somebody sells a plot, somebody sells a house, and he brings the money to the servant of God. Today, in Kenya, that person will be prosecuted. Yes, as a fraudster, as a conman. But they don't understand when the grace is at work. Much grace and great power. This is a combination of two. Great power and much grace was upon them. So when you combine the two, great power, much grace, people settle their plot, people settle their houses, and they bring those money to the servant of God. Then from there, the servant of God can use that money to advance the gospel. So concentrate in building your capacities. Great power is all about your capacity. Much grace is all about the spirit you are moving with. Praise Jesus Christ. Spiritual revelation is very key. Another thing you require spiritual revelation. Acts 11, 27. 27. During this time, some, uh, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that uh, a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This they did, sending the, their gift to the elders, to the pastors in Jerusalem, by Barnabas and Saul. But it was through a spiritual revelation that Agabus, a prophet, by the Spirit predicted. So if you are going to make money, so these people collected a lot of money for pastors who were in Jerusalem. They were not aware of their people who were collecting money for them. But what happened? They had received a revelation. So it is very good to walk under spiritual revelations. Sometimes, even when you are a pastor, it is good to pray for your members, for your people, or for God to, to put it in people's minds, in people's hearts. Let God speak revelations to people. There are many people who rise up and say, God commanded me, and you are not aware. So God gave them revelations. God Open their mind to understand the need of a man of God. And as such, they rose to supply. So, if you are a servant of God and you want to work in, uh, in, 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 in financial excellence, be praying for people to be given revelations about you. Revelations of need about you. For Jesus Christ. Let somebody be given a burden through a, a dream. Let a person be given a revelation through a burden. Naskia muzigo muzito daniake. Anashidwa kurara. And then come looking for you. Come seeking you and telling you, I have been commanded by God to give you this envelope. They received a revelation. Pray Jesus Christ.
Something else is get a mobilizer. Get a spirit of mobilizer. Second Corinthians 8 verse 21. Get a mobilizer. Hmm? Second Corinthians 8 verse 21. This is a very good one. For we are take, taking pains to do what is right. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Second Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse 21. Let me just read something there. Before we continue, there is a, there is a word I, I want to concentrate on. In addition, we are ascending, we are in verse 22. We are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that, that he is zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and a fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and uh, an honor to Christ. Let, 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 let me just, let me, let me just, I, I never wanted to go to that verse, but let me just go back to that verse because it will help us to understand. Let us start from verse 10. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness, willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved or you are hard pressed, but uh, that there might be equality. At the present time, your apprentice will supply what they need so that in the apprentice will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathers much did not have much, and he who gathered little did not have little. This, this is the law of willingness, eager willingness. Pray for people to have that spirit of willingness. God used that, 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 that truth very much. He used that technique very much. You remember even in the wilderness, he told Moses, go and tell people, whoever whose heart is willing, if you read Ezra 1, if you read the word in the book of Ezra 1, the Bible says, uh, those whom God had moved their heart to give. It is good as a pastor, you pray for the heart of people to have the eager willingness, not just willingness, but it's good they have eager, they be eager. So they have that strong desire to give. They are servants of God. They can come and give us a very powerful piece of gospel. But when it comes to giving, you can plead with the people even for two hours to give. And they are not willing to give. And another man of God will come and stand. Even without asking them to give, you find people coming to say they are tapping. They are tapping. What's the difference between you and you two? Because this one, is moving the spirit that moves people's heart to give. But this one, this the other one, people have not, uh, their heart are not melting towards him. Pray for that to happen. Praise Jesus Christ. Okay. Let us look something else. Let me read the word in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 7 to 9. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As sure as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the region of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. So you need these people I'm calling mobilizers. So 
pray for people to have eager willingness, but to also have immobilizers. He is saying, when I was in need, there were brothers who came from Macedonia and they supplied whatever was lacking in me. So have finances. It is good to have mobilizers. It is good to have people who can finance you. And these are very difficult in the getting. So sometimes a man of God, you need to sow a seed. You need to make a sacrifice. Go to somebody who have made it and tell him, me, I want God to give me providers, suppliers, financiers, partners, sow a seed to attract them to you. Because Paul was fighting his silver in a financial crisis. But always there were people who were being sent to him. And they would come and they would supply whatever he was lacking. They would come and uh, they would make things work for him. Uh, uh, let me just read. There is, some, there is a word I want to read. Let me read these guys. First Corinthians chapter number 16. First Corinthians and chapter number 16 and verse 17. I was glad when Stephanas, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. So you need to have financiers. And they don't need to be known by anybody. But they are there. They supply your needs. And in many servants of God, their gospels have become very easy because of these people. These people. I call them mobilizers. Financial mobilizers. They can go and uh, make huge money, but they are partnered with you to support you in your gospel. Something else is prayer and word ministry. Prayer and the word ministry. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say that. Ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. Let us concentrate here in Acts 6, 3, 6. Acts 6, chapter number 3. Verse 3, sorry. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the apostles, we are getting people who were supplying food to a point that uh, people started to complain there were disparities. You know, there were disparities. Mm -hmm. But it is not Iraq that was there. It is it's just because there was some, some, some form of... Uh, 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 disparities of a certain kind. There is a word I was looking for. Ubaguzi. Walikuwa na baguana. The Jewish windows and the Greek windows. Mm, they, were, they, were, they were overlooking one group over to the advantage of the other. But not here. So meaning the provisions were there. The distribution was a problem. So, what was the secret of these pastors led by Peter? They were concentrating on ministry. They have called it prayer and the ministry of the word. So, prayer is a very key and ministry of word. Don't distort the ministry of word. So, because they were concentrating in prayer and in the ministry of word, they never racked people to supply to them. What if they stopped? What if they moved their, they moved their attention from prayer and from the ministry of the word and they concentrate on the waiting on the table? So what would have happened? The provision would have been withdrawn automatically. Because what was attracting the provisions was they are paying serious attention to prayers and they are seriously in the ministry of word. Not very key. Something else is a fishing line. That is Matthew 17 verse 24 to 27 and Revelation 3 verse 8. He says, buy from me. That was called of spiritual monetary currency. Make sure man of God you have it. 
There are many servants of God who don't have the fishing line. Jesus tells Peter, go to the lake and the first fish you catch, it has money in it. You need to have covenant of money. Covenant with the money. Make a covenant with the money. I won't explain that further. Mother, seek that dream. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. For the servant of God to make money, he was telling those disciples, those apostles, not look at the pagans, the way they are doing their things. They are doing, they are giving bribes, they are corrupt, they are running here and there, they are trying everything possible to make money, but you, you, seek the kingdom of God first. And what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God first? Number one, is to get born again. Number two, is to allow the will of God to be done here on earth as it is being done in heaven. That's key. Number two, his righteousness, invest in holiness. He has said, these things shall be added unto you. So, you need to enter in the kingdom of God. And I've told you what it means to, 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 to seek the kingdom of God first. I've told you, number one is getting born again. First of all, you denounce your paternity of this world. So you get born again. So you become a child of God, a child of the kingdom of heaven. Number two, allow the perfect will of God to be done here on earth and is being done in heaven. Now you are in the kingdom of God. Number two, seek his holiness. Invest in holiness. Seek his righteousness. Invest in the holiness. That is about character, uh, not the character moderation, but the character development. Develop your character. Have a character. He says, and these things shall be added unto you. You will not look for them. You will not hunger for them. They will be added to you. And I think we are finding it difficult to understand this scripture. Because we are understanding it the way we want. Because of where we are. But it is open as it is. Seeking the kingdom of God first. It is expanded, but I'm just trying to give you the simplest way to understand it. Is getting born again. And you're not getting born again for convenience. You are getting born again to belong to God. And number two, allowing the perfect will of God to be done in your life. Not your will. Allowing the perfect will of God to be done in your life. Thy will be done here on earth that is being done in heaven. And you are the earth. So the will of God to be done in you as it is being done in heaven. Then seek his righteousness then. That means holiness. That means develop heavenly character. With the two, he says, and these things shall be added unto you. Then something else is the power of Christ. Walk with the power of Christ. Matthew 10 verse 8 to 2. Matthew 10, 8 to 10. Matthew 10. 8 to 10. Matthew 10, 8 to 10. <clears throat> Hear the sick. Let's adjust us from verse 7. As you go preach this message, kingdom of heaven is near. Hear the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse, cleanse those who have a reproce. Drive out demons. Now I don't know. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not take around any gold. Don't take money or a silver or a copper in your, in, 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 in your belt. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. You get me? I want you to understand this scripture. Look at it in Luke 22 verse 33. Luke 22 and verse 23. Luke 22 and verse 33. <coughs> Not that three, that is verse 35. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without the pass, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they asked. So, what is this Jesus gave them? That when they went, they did not lack anything. It is written in Matthew 10, verse 1. He called the 
his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. So there is something, there is a deposit Jesus put in them. His authority, authority of Christ. Luke 10, 19. Jesus gave them his authority, the power of Christ. So make sure if you are going to connect with the sources of money, make sure you are operating with the authority of Christ, not in your own authority. He asked them in Luke 22, 35, when I sent you without wallet, without a porch, without anything, did you lack anything? No. What did Jesus give them? Matthew 10, verse 1. He gave them authority to drive out the demons and to heal the sick. In other words, we can say, Ministry of healing and deliverance. You get me? Ministry of healing and deliverance. Make it, it is real in you. Activate the authority. Activate the power of Christ to trample on his neck and his scorpion and overcoming the power of the enemy. Because when they went with that authority, they did not go as disciples. They went as apostles. And only apostle is connected to the persons of supply, not the disciple. Not the disciple. It's when who is an apostle. An apostle, according to this definition, we have only other diverse definitions. Eh? According to the definition, is an apostle is a carrier of authority of Jesus. So carry the authority of Jesus to cast out the demons and to heal the sick, and you shall receive money. Money. How can you heal somebody cancer and fail to give and give hard somebody? How can you cast out the demons? These people have a huge following. People who have the ministry of healing and deliverance. They have huge following. Jesus told them, if you go with this, with this, with this anointing, with this authority of healing and deliverance, you don't need to carry money. You don't need to carry wallet because provisions are waiting for you out there. Pray Jesus Christ. Work hard in ministry. If you are going to make money, servants of God, work hard in the ministry. Work hard. First Thessalonians 5, 12. First Thessalonians. 5 verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you. Who are over you? See, this is a pastor. This is a pastor. Who are over you in the Lord? And who admonish you? Verse 13. Hold them in the highest regard in love. Because of their work, live in peace with each other. He says, Hold them in the highest regard in love. How do you exercise love? Through giving. There is no love without giving. No, 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 no. And he says, but he says, for them to be held with the highest regard in love, and highest regard in love is giving, is if they are working hard. Respect those who work hard among you, who are over you, in the Lord. These are the pastors. These are the ministers of the gospel. And who admonish you, who instruct you, who preach to you, who teach you, who guide you, who counsel you. He's saying, these people, they work hard. So minister, me, I'm considering on the minister, work hard. Because there is a word commanding them what they should do to you. If you work hard in being over them in the Lord, that is being their spiritual cover, and also admonishing them. If you work absolutely hard, there is a word commanding them to respect you and <clears throat> to hold you with the highest regard in love. There is a word already authorizing them and they cannot escape it. But what about you? You, you just work absolutely hard, absolutely hard in being over them, in the Lord, by being a good spiritual cover and admonishing them in Jesus' name. 
Hey. Another way, <coughs> Hebrews 13 verse 17, spiritual vigilance. Man of God, for you to make money, you need to be spiritually vigilant. Hebrews 13 verse 17. Obey your leaders <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry, and submit to their authorities. To, to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy. So that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Another way, servant of God, you make money is if you are spiritually vigilant for those people. Yes. These people will not give you money if you do not keep watch over them as a man will give an account. You don't pray for them. You don't protect them. You don't secure them. You don't fight their battles. You don't wake up in the night to pray for them. How then will they connect with your need, with your needs? Because the Bible is already commanding them to obey you. The Bible is already commanding them to obey you so that your work can be a joy. So already there is a scripture condemning them if they disregard you. But you, as a servant of God, you are under a certain obligation. It is your responsibility to keep watch over them as a man, as a person who must give an account. If you do that, you keep watch over them, protecting them, securing them, you know, seeking interventions for them, transacting for them in the spiritual realm, defending them, arbitrating for them, adjudicating for them. You're going to be getting revelations for them. You are there praying in the night. So if you are watching, not here, they keep watch over you as men who give account them. So obey them so that their work can be a joy. How can you obey your spiritual? How can you obey your leaders and submit to their authority? Now I am your leader. How can you obey me and submit to my authority? You do that simply in your giving. Because how else would you do so? How? How? C can you just show me how you serve a, a pastor? He is on the altar. How can you serve him? Apart from the ashes, praise and worship team. How else can you serve that pastor, man of God on the altar? You only serve him. The only area you serve him is when you come with your envelope and you put it in that offering basket. Your business ends there. And then he is now left with the obligation to continue serving you, preaching to you, praying for you, delivering you, hearing you, speaking to you, encouraging you, motivating you. He is left with all that business. And that's how you make his work a joy. When you obey his leadership and you submit to his authority. But him, he must be keeping watch over you as one who will give an account. I want to insist there. As one who will give an account. So he is not just keeping watch over you so that he can gain. He is also keeping watch over you because he shall he shall deliver you in the hands of the Lord in the last day. So pass that how you make money. It's not through this cartoon work we are seeing every day in our churches. Pray Jesus Christ. Overseership, being a good steward. They are servants of God, ministers of God, who are uh, just manipulators or whatever. First Peter 5 verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a, wit a witness of Christ's suffering, and one who will, will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, <clears throat> serving as overseers, 
Not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be not greedy for money. Not greedy for money. But eager to serve. Not rolling it over those entrusted to you. But being examples to the frog. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You will receive a crown of glory. So as a servant of God, what qualifies you to receive a crown of glory is simply being a good overseer, being a good shepherd. Who is an overseer? Pray Jesus Christ. Be a good manager. Don't take advantage of them. Don't manipulate people to make money. Don't fraud people. Don't practice some tricks. Don't merchandise the gospel. Don't try to do more than civilized witchcraft, selling things and all that. Just be an overseer. And he's saying, what do you need to do as an overseer? Serve with willingness and with eagerness. Willingness and eagerness. So you, you just be an overseer. Do, the, do that work not for yourself. Do it for the Lord. The Bible says, when the Lord comes, he will give you a crown of glory. And, no one, and it, will never, it will never fade away. So you find you enter into a level. Into a level. Crown of glory is a level. You enter into a level of financial glory that is not fading away. Even if people try to say anything to you, they don't shake you. Because you are now walking, you, you already have the crown of glory. But that one you attain if you are a good steward. Not the shepherds written in Ezekiel 34 who slaughter the fat sheep. No, 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 no. Don't be greedy. Yeah? Don't be greedy. Mm. Don't be greedy for money. Don't be greedy for money. No matter how you can hide it, it is inside your spirit. You can see it. And these are tests of servant of God. You will be tested until greed for money dies in you. Dies completely. That is when you serve. You don't serve to gain, but you serve to minister. You serve to make God happy. You serve to advance God. You serve to make God known. That is when you receive the crown of glory, which never fades away. Pray Jesus Christ. His presence, the presence of the Lord. Make sure you are walking in the presence of God. Yes, finances goes to where the presence of God is. Genesis 28, 22. Genesis 28, 28, 22. Uh, 28, 22. And these... <clears throat> Stone that I have stepped, set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Verse 15 I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until you have done what I promised you. So, this God promising Jacob that I am going with you, my I will not leave you. The princess of the Lord. And Jacob tells him, whatever you shall give me, I will give you tithe. And we know what happened with Jacob when he went to the house of Rabban. In, in Genesis chapter number 30 verse 43. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large frogs and men servant and men servant and comes and dogs. Why? The Lord told him, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be with you. If the presence of the Lord is with you, servants of God, you will always find a way of making money. That is clean, clean money. Pray Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Ha. We thank God for the service. Now I'm going to church so that we can be blessed. 
first uh, Corinthians 16 and verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no corrections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men. You approve and set them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Have what we call a financial program. Don't just operate in the periphery. Don't just operate by assumptions. Don't just operate with, with your mind. Have a financial program. You see, they are being told, correct money before I come. So when I come, you don't have to correct when I'm there. I just, and I see this program working very well with the Catholic. Catholic, they apply this program very much. Religion are very good in this program. Have a money program. That's why you find you, you, you gather a pool of financiers, pool of financial partners, and then they have a, a leader of their own, and they collect the money to support a man of God. So you don't come to them, bring you us, bring you No, they have already collected it. So when you come, they give it to you as a package. Have a financial program. Man of God, I believe, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will start making money and you will not struggle financially in the name of Jesus Christ. And I decree and I declare you will no longer struggle financially. Praise Jesus Christ. You will no longer struggle financially as long as you are a servant of God. We decree and declare to start flowing with the finances. Last point. For the servant of God to make money is be a faithful tither. Numbers chapter number 18 verse 24. Instead, I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. This is why I said concerning them, they will have no inheritance among the Israelites. So pass them to make money and encourage your people to tithe. Because Tithing is your payment. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Levite and he said to them, When you receive from the Israelite the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offerings. Uh -huh. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In this way, you will present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From this tithe, you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron, the priest. You must present as a Lord's portion the best and holiest among a part of everything given to you. So for a pastor to make money, you must encourage those who are under you or those you preach to, to tithe. But in order for that to be possible, you yourself, you must also tithe to Aaron. That is why you must have an Aaron, a spiritual cover, and then tithe to that Aaron. Tithe to that Aaron. So that the people can tithe to you. A pastor who does not tithe to Aaron or to the Melchizedek. You get me? The, the, the office of Aaron was, 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 was nullified by Christ. And a new office of priesthood was introduced in the order of Melchizedek. And now, in this office, in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ has made us our priests. But he has lanked us. Some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be pastors, some to be teachers, some to be evangelists. You get I me? Mean? Make sure you have a spiritual covering where you go and tithe. Or because... Tithe connects to tithe. And the tithe activates tithe in Jesus' name. Your blessed start making money in Jesus' name. Pastors, we, shall, we will now start working with the good money. We will not struggle financially again. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen. I'm Joel Hapame. My number is 0112-796463. My YouTube account is New Page TV or Apostle Joel Hapame. Facebook is Hapame Joel. Let us preach the gospel of God together. You are blessed. Amen. Shalom.